All right, everybody, welcome back to the Move Podcast. This is episode five of the Best of the Blue Train. Damn, this has been fun. Looking back on all these things that they couldn't take, our memories. Oh boy, those were the days. Today's stage, we're talking about another kind of famous stage, a bunch of technical stuff, crashes, mostly my fault. To finish up to lose art at end with a little cameo of the tourmalade just before, which is when, um, just to, for background, that this was the closest tour victory of them all. It was absolutely miserable. My friends and co hosts all thought it was the best one. I said, No, it, it's terrible, it sucked. Um, Jan got away from me on the tourmalade. I thought, That's it, you know, this is <clears throat> this is the one I lose. Manage to reel him back and then and then somehow win the stage and then and then go on to win uh, number five in two thousand three. So again, lose our den with the cameo of the Tourmalet. Like every other episode, uh, brought to you in conjunction with our good friends over at PowerDot. Boy, they're doing a great job. Twenty uh, percent off. Go to PowerDot.com slash the move. Use the buy code the move. The other cool thing is they've got uh, they've they've. They've provided some of their ambassadors to come on and and uh, and talk to us, to all of us. Uh, uh, I'm really excited about today's a fellow named Josh Bridges. Um, his boys, he done it all. Uh, was a member of the SEAL teams, um, several deployments. Um, went on to be a CrossFit um, competitor and champion. Absolute badass. Now I got his own coffee line called Good Dudes Coffee. And as after I talked to him, I thought, well, that's, that makes sense because he is a good dude. Anyways, I think you'll, I, 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 those who know my, my history, you know, I'm a big fan of the special forces and uh, not, you know, you're not so much for just how tough they are, but just their, their dedication and, and service to our country. And you talk about tip of the spear. We speak about tip of the spear all the time. Uh, these guys are truly tip of the spear. So Josh, on for about 10 minutes, just talking about his experience overseas and, and CrossFit and what a guy. So uh, today's show is also brought to you by Hyperice. Now this company, I got to tell you something, you know, th- this is a brand that I've actually been buying forever. I have loved these products. I mean, you, you can see, I mean, I've had this ball. So look, look how worked this ball is. Um, it's just something that, that I found over the years to be, just a game changer for me when it comes to recovery. Um, They are the world's most powerful percussion massage device. They're also a wellness tech company that makes devices designed to help you move better. And you get to be my age and you need to move better from handheld massage devices to vibrating foam rollers, thermal technology, Norma tech compression systems. Hyper ice helps you warm up faster, recover quicker and simply move better. Enhance your own workout routine with the same tech used in pro training rooms throughout the NBA, NFL, MLB, Major League Soccer, Ironmans, you name it. The shit just works. Designed to help improve circulation, flexibility, relief tension. Um, just, again, I, I've been a fan of this company for a long time. And, and uh, I was just some sucker buying it on the internet and having it uh, change my day. So for right now, get 50 bucks off all percussion devices and $300 off all Norma tech packages. There's no code needed. Plus you get an additional 10% off with the code hype, the move at hyper ice. That's H Y P E R I C E.com and use the code hype, the move for 10% off. Like most episodes as well, brought to you by Roca started by athletes for athletes in Austin, Texas, these, you know, I put them on every week. These matadors, I heard today, there's the damn things are sold out. I mean, I'm serious. They're sold out. That, and I, I love them. I mean, I have all the colors and the lens is absolutely the best thing out there. They are sold out. I, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. I, I think it's a good thing. I'm like, these things are so good. They're sold out. Um, that's their new one. I'm obviously a big fan of the readers. Um, I wonder if Hyper Ice has any percussion technology for my eyes because they're not going that well. Um, bunch of pros on the pro tour, men and women, uh, rocking uh, the Rokas. 
again, out of Austin, Texas, my, my favorite thing out these days, roca.com, R-O-K-A.com, 25% off for our listeners at roca.com. Go to roca, my bad, roca.com slash the move. That's us, the move, 25% off. All right, everybody. So uh, like last episode, we, we have yet another um, special guest. Our guest today is Josh Bridges, who is just a complete badass. Um, former SEAL, proud father, entrepreneur, CrossFitter. Uh, Josh, before we jump in, I just, and people that have followed my show, that they know, I mean, I'm just a, a, a total uh, mega fan of the special forces and the commitment that uh, you have all made to our country. So for that, just, just get that out of the way. I just want to say thank you. Um, I've actually spent a little or enough time, I guess, around the seals at, at right down the road from you in Coronado went and w- once did that O course over there, which is the big obstacle course, um, which is fucking terrifying. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, and then I spoke at hell week, which was terrifying again, because it was, it's seeing these young kids going through, just the worst week of their life was just next level. So must be, I can't even imagine. Oh, no, I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, you know, thank you for having me on and I'm a huge fan of yours. So this is an honor for me to be on the show. Um, you know, stoked to get to sit here and chat with you and have a, you know, that we're all both uh, ambassadors of power. Dot. And, um, not, yeah, like I said, like I've appreciated you and what you've done and everything. So thank you again for having me on. Yeah. Um, so how, when, when did you, speaking of hell week, when did you go through hell week and, and, and finally sort of jump into the, to the seal brotherhood? So I joined the Navy in March of 2007, uh, went to buds straight out of boot camp. Um, so I got to buds in May, late May of 2007. Um, I was actually luckily enough, lucky enough to get pushed forward into the training because they thought the class that I was supposed to be in was going to be too big. And so they were like, Hey, we have a class that's getting ready to class up. Why don't you ju- jump? If you, if anybody wants to jump in, you're, you're more than welcome to. Um, and so I volunteered. Um, I was like, yeah, let's get this going. I'm ready to go. So um, I went through a week in, I feel like it was uh, July, uh, late June, late June of it was either late June or early July of 07. I can't remember and, the exact month. And for y'all at home, so you got to go to, you know, you join the Navy and, and then you decide you want to be a SEAL. You, you, they throw you into hell week. Um, and it's truly hell. Like I, like I said a second ago, I was there just, just to see these young folks. I mean, they were comatose. And they were still at this point, I don't, I don't recall how many started. There are probably 30 left. And it's, and, and guys, for those listening home, I mean, it's real simple, man. If you don't make it out, or if you, you literally have to tap out, right? You got, if you say, I ah, fuck this, I'm quitting. You got to go over and ring the bell and go home and you will never be a seal. Um, but if you don't make it through, that's it. You just can't. And at the end, you know, there's a handful of y'all that make it through and it's, you know, there's, there's no rules, right? I mean, it's, it's, they don't say, okay, guys and gals, y'all get to sleep you know, 12 hours a night and then we'll wake you up. And we're going to go hard. No, it's like, no, you don't know what you're going to have to do, which to me is just, I'd go crazy because I love to sleep, but dude, <laughs> right. Yeah. Throw you, in, it was, throw, you in, throw you in cold water, all of that. Yeah. It's a, it, it was a, it was a trip. It was a, it was an experience for sure. And, uh, well, like we always say, we joke, you know, um, whenever you're at like, like right now, like any time after that, Anytime you're in a shitty situation, it's always like, well, at least I'm not in hell week anymore. So we'll see know. that that's a life is about perspective. And right. actually speaking of power dot, I was introduced to power dot, uh, through the great Mitch Hall, who was a seal team six guy. And he called me a couple that's probably been three years ago now and said, dude, you got to check out this product. Like this is yeah, it's pretty cool. So they sent me some stuff and then, and then uh, Mitch and Eric came out to visit us in Austin. And, and I was like, all right, this is a game changer. Like this, I grew up doing East M fucking unit was like this big <laughs> and cost a bunch right. of money. And you certainly didn't do it at home. And I was like, okay, this is next level. Right. I mean, it's just, it, yeah, exactly. I was the exact same way when I was introduced to power dot, I remember the, um, guy came over to the house and he, uh, he showed it to me and I was like, okay, this is cool. You know, like, 
a little, always a little like, eh, I don't know if it's going to work or not. Um, you know, I've been doing fitness for however long and I think I know everything. And then exactly you get slammed with throwing some nodes on your body and you can't walk for two days because it's insanely like powerful, the tool. And so yeah. been, I, I, that was the first thing I said was I wish I had this when I was in the military. <laughs> Well, you're right. I mean, it would be a great case study for, you know, you guys, you know, this better, you can tell us better than anybody. I mean, just, you got the, when you're out in the field, I mean, the pack, you don't want to carry a bunch of stuff. And so, you know, bigger, fast or light or smaller, I should say smaller, stronger, faster, which is better. And so, um, how many tours did you do, Josh? I did three. I did two to Iraq and one Afghanistan. Man. I don't even, I mean, I did a couple of USO trips and you know how that is. I mean, they look after us, but still just being there, being looked after and secure. I was like, fuck this. man. <laughs> this is, yeah. Mm -mm. No, it was fun. It was a great time. I, I loved every aspect of it. Um, it's opened up so many opportunities for me and I uh, got to experience some really cool thing and meet some amazing men that I look up to and, uh, every part about it was awesome. You know, for me, the only reason I decided to get out and step away was because I wanted to spend more time with my kids. I had two young boys and for me, I didn't want to miss them, miss them growing up. So let me ask you this. If, if something, cause I've no, I know a lot of y'all across all the special forces and, and you share this one, at least the ones I know share one trait and it's this never ending desire to actually go back. So let's just say something as we were talking, something nine 11 esque happens. And, uh, it, I mean, it, it just, it, it, it obviously rocks all of us, but you guys at the tip of the spirit rocks more than anybody. If they called you tonight and said, you, you, you're the, one of the best we've ever had. Can you leave tomorrow morning? What would you say? I'd say, I'd say yes. You know, so, like at, so this, this, at this point, yeah, at this point it's like, okay, I can, I can get away for six months or however long they need me. Um, but yeah, that was, that was what you did. Right. People always ask me that question. I'm like, man, I, do you really like, that's what you want to do. That's what you want to, you want to go to war. It'd be like, I'm like, it'd be like saying you want to practice a sport for your entire life, but never play a game. You know, that was the only way I could put it into perspective growing up being a, an athlete, you know, it was like, like, Hey, uh, you're, you're going to go and pl practice baseball for, you know, five years and then, but never actually go get to play a game. So like people mm -hmm. were, were like, you really want to go to war. And I was like, of course I want to go to war. So yeah, that is an iconic answer. I mean, people look, nobody, nobody wants us to have wars, but if something happens, if it's, if the case arises where you got to go, you got to go. And it's just, I love that answer. Every one of you dudes, every one of you bad motherfuckers, the, it's, it is just universal. It's like, yes, let's go. I mean, you, right. you probably have some 80 year old guy who they're not going to call, <laughs> but he'd be like, I'll, I'll go, I'll go. I mean, it's just <laughs> such a, fucking studly answer. I love it. God, that's cool, man. Phone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just, I want to talk just for a sec about CrossFit. Cause then you got out and, and to your point, you know, you got to itch the itch somehow. Right. And so, right. uh, if, if that part of, I know that I've, I've done that in my life. Um, but there's gotta be, there's gotta be something to fill the void. And for you, it was CrossFit, which is, you know, certainly, um, the pressure of that has got to be much different than war, but physically yeah. it's got to be, it's got to be right up there. Um, and what a gnarly sport, by the way, uh, I never done that. Like I can do like five pull-ups, but, uh, <laughs> but these CrossFitters and these in the games and the, it's crazy. And, and tell me this, cause I've always been curious. Cause I heard this, which is just such a trip. They don't, t do they tell you the events that you're going to do, or do you just show up? Uh, and they just spring it on you. It it depends on the, uh, the, the competition. So some of the competition you get, so there's three phases to the games. Um, there's two qualifiers and then you go to qualify for the CrossFit games. And when you go to the CrossFit games, so the CrossFit, the open is actually done in your house. Um, it's done. Uh, you get, or, or at your, at your local gym or at your house, wherever you want to do it, but you get, so you get a week to do the workout and you have to video it send it in and, and get like, make sure that it qualifies for it. And so that that's one aspect of it. So you kind of have a little bit of an idea, but only a week, uh, a week to basically, or like five days to do the workout. You basically, they release it on, um, uh, Thursday nights and then you have to submit by Monday. So yes, exactly. Like here's your workout, go do it, send it in. And then you have, um, the second qualifier, which is now a sanctional 
uh, where you go to a competition and typically, yeah, those, they don't release the workouts until, um, at least like a, at the, at the earliest, about a week and a half, maybe two weeks prior to you going to the competition. So you have a little bit of time to kind of start to like, see what those workouts would feel like. Um, probably not run through the whole, the whole weekend because there's typically six to eight events, uh, for a weekend. And so you don't want to like get hammered two weeks prior to going to your competition. So you can't do them like full blast. And then the games is different every year. They kind of, uh, they kind of adjust. Sometimes they'll release workouts a month out. And then other times they won't even tell you what you're doing until you're walking out on the floor. And then they've literally actually even done an event where they don't even tell you after like they, they used that you guys start the workout and then there, it was called chaos. It was kind of crazy. They told you the movement to start performing. You didn't even know how many reps you were supposed to do. And when your judge told you to move to the next station, that's the only time you knew. So you didn't even know how many reps you were going to be doing during the workout. So it was, it's, it's, it's all over. It's at every, every aspect, every spectrum. And so, yeah, you have to be ready for everything. It's kind of crazy. And you guys just get messed up. I mean, we'll, we'll get, I mean, if I did that, <clears throat> I'll tell you something, I'd be power. I'd have a power dot on every inch of my body. I swear to God, I, I'm, you're young. I mean, I'm an old man. My, I got my, my cane is right over here, but yeah, I mean, you just, guys are just getting rocked and that is, you know, people that's, if you had to, I mean, obviously CrossFit's gone through a, a, a interesting couple of weeks here, but yeah. you know, if, if you had to say one thing, the injury rate rate was, was, you know, typically higher than perhaps other, um, you know, other platforms, but dude, you must've been power dotting your ass off to just stay oh, on peace. I use my power dot every single day and I still do. And, uh, I'm in a phase right now where I'm kind of like getting towards the back end of my career. I'm 37 years old and in CrossFit years, that's like a hundred. And so, um, yeah, but I still use that power dot every single day. That thing was a lifesaver. Exactly. Because you, there's always, and CrossFit, it's, there's always something you can be working on, whether it's, um, you know, Olympic weightlifting, gymnastics, uh, uh, monostructural, right? So there's always something new every day. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, and then now you got a new company. This is, I, I didn't, I didn't know, as I started to dig in here, we got the Good Dudes Coffee. Yeah, Good Dudes Coffee. Yeah, just, uh, we launched it a little over a year ago. Uh, really excited about it. Really pumped. Um, we offer uh, five single origin coffees. I, I became a big coffee nerd over in Iraq. I was so dumb that I didn't realize I was ordering unroasted coffee and I got like 60 pounds of unroasted coffee <laughs> sent over to Iraq. And so um, I was like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? And so I bought a roaster, had a roaster shipped over there and I started roasting coffee in Iraq in my, uh, in my trailer. So that was how I got into it. And then I just kind of loved it every, I love coffee. I love the roasting. I love just nerding out on it, how to brew it, everything. So I said, why not? Let's do this. See, this is the advantage of being in the special forces or the seals specifically, because if you're like a guy or gal on day one and you're just, uh, you know, you're not in the special forces and you, and you say to your commander, you know, I, could you send, can I have a roaster sent over? <laughs> Right. The, just the guy's like, uh, no, I don't think yeah. so. So that's what, but you guys, you know, that's the, as I said, the tip of the spear. So, Hey, sir, uh, I'm going to have a roaster sent over. Is that all right? And they're like, yeah, <laughs> right. that's fucking it was, cool. yeah, it was, we were treated very, very nicely. Like I, we did not live in most instances, instances, we did not live rough. Like, um, at least I didn't in my, in my, there were definitely guys who have in certain it depended on where you went and how long we had been there at the time. So when I went to Iraq, this was in 2010, very late in the game. Um, I was in Fallujah and we, I mean, we weren't roughing it by any means. I had a whole trailer to myself. I had Wi-Fi in my room, you know, like not a, not a rough life. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's, I'm not buying that because you were, I've been there that <laughs> screw those places. I'm just telling you. <laughs> If I never go again, it's too soon. So I can't imagine. <laughs> but I love uh, just, I have to, before I let you run, I, I love this line on the website is addressing co people. I love coffee. I drink coffee every morning, gets my day going. Um, but it, it, the headline says, stop drinking bad coffee. It says you drink coffee that tastes bad because it's a hassle to find coffee that tastes good and is worth the price. You might not even know 
that the coffee you're drinking tastes bad. Like it's true. <laughs> it is so true. I read that. And I was like, Oh shit. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Damn. I mean, there's, there's so much bad coffee out there and it's what so many people are used to doing it. Uh, they, they're just, they're just used to that normal coffee taste. Right. And now we have this big third wave coffee movement and, uh, you can easily find good coffee. Now you just have to actually take the time to go do it. So yeah, it's really cool. I, I'm, I'm really enjoying the process of it. It's been fun. I need a little favor though. This is the last thing I'll say before I do let you go. I, I just got a favor because <laughs> then I hit, clicked on shop and I saw the hat on here, the good dude's hat. I was like, Oh, that's dope. Oh yeah. Oh this yeah. Which, sold out. Oh, uh, we got you. We'll get you. We'll get you one. Easy day. Can you hook is a brother the, up? Uh, for sure. Easy day. Is it the golf hat? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, it's the rope hat. Yeah, I got it. So Done. you got the American flag on this. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. Yeah. Is it a script or a di- script or the diamond logo? Which one? Are, I'll send you both. To be honest. Never mind. I love that. I, got I love it. Well, man, yep. thanks for being here. Uh, more importantly, thanks for your service. Uh, huge fan, huge fan of all the, you know, all the teams. And, um, I appreciate it. And by the way, by the way, for your, for the sake of your family, I hope nothing happens right now while we're talking, because I'd rather you stay at home. And I know, (laughs) I know, I know your better half would rather you stay at home and your little ones. And so let's just hope that shit doesn't happen. And, uh, you just, why don't you just stick to coffee and CrossFit? Okay. (laughs) Got it. Got it. Well, Lance, I really appreciate having me on, man. This is an honor to get to sit and chat with you. Thank you. Awesome, brother. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Move Podcast. I'm your host, Lance Armstrong, alongside over there on my Zoom screen, somewhere in Europe, Johan Bernil, below him, somewhere in Austin. By the way, that's my seat, JB. You're sitting in my seat. I know, and I don't sit on a cushion. Okay, and <laughs> serious. I, I, by the way, I swear to God, I'm getting shorter. It's so fucking funny. Like I, I, Anna is taller than me now. I, I'm, I am getting shorter. I don't, it, I think that happens when you get older and then over there, let me do it. Let me do it. Lance here. Yeah. That's what I have to do. And guess what? Let me show you something else. I'm sitting down right now. I, <laughs> so I fuck y'all. I'm getting shorter and it's true. It's, but whatever I'm getting fit. You missed it. Hincapi. Look right here. Huh? Hey, George. I, I, I have missed it. You better go chop some wood. And also in uh, where they chop wood. Not good. Who the fuck chops wood anymore? In Greenville, South Carolina, I guess they still chop wood. By the way, it's summer. What, it's, um, it, it's summer. What are you going to do with wood in the summer? But nonetheless, <laughs> you know, uh, full transparency, we had packaged these two together as we watched all this. You know, that stage in the gap with the crash, the field, the devastation that it wrecked or wreaked on, on, on Joseba Baloki's career. And obviously that tour, uh, we, we had to separate them, right? We had to, <clears throat> as we watched it, it was so epic. We were so honored to have Joseba on and, and uh, we felt like we should split up Luzard again. Another crazy day. Again, to Johan's point, Jan was on point on his game. We were on our heels. I was on my heels. Um, and this is a nasty day. I mean, the tourmalay is, uh, especially from that side is one of the arguably one of the hardest climbs. It's got to be top three or four uh, in the country of France. Um, and and then it just that was just the warm up. Then we get to lose Art Den. You'll see the incident with with the the bag and the kid on the side of the road, which I take full responsibility for. Hey, speaking of kids, hey kids out there, don't ride so close to the side of the road. Yo, Johan used to always come on the radio and in the TTs. Cause I would always stay as far right as I could or left. I don't know why he's like, Hey Lance, move over a little bit. <laughs> like he would tell me like, literally, why don't you just move over? I'm like, I, I'm busy right now, Johan, but you, are you that worried about where <laughs> you would always say move over? What turns out he's right. <laughs> Fucking ran right into this kid's feed bag. Anyways, exciting day. Uh, we're going to, this thing kicks off right, right on the tourmalade, which I remember when Jan went, I thought, okay, this is, I did not have a very big lead. And I thought this, that we're, I'm in trouble. I really, really thought I was in trouble. By the way, I thought I was in trouble in this tour all the way till the fat, the last lap in, in, in Paris. So 
And just to let people know that it was only, you were only seconds apart. What was it? 18 seconds, maybe going into the stage. Do I have that correct? 15 seconds. 15 seconds. 15 seconds. seconds. Which, yeah. and you, you know, still had a time it, trial ahead. Eight, yeah. It was 18 yeah. seconds separating the top three of overall yeah. Tour de France at so, that moment, which is. So, so have in mind, so have in mind, so, the Tour de France. so I think Lance lost a little bit of time in the prologue to Jan, which was insignificant, but then uh, lost a lot of time in the, in the time trial. Uh, the Cap de Couvert with the heat, and then lost a little bit of time on uh, Axle Trois Domaine, which was uh, also not expected. So, you know, in instead of gaining time, you just kept losing a little bit, little, little, little bit of time. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, you had, I, I guess you had gained time on him on Abdues before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we had gained time on them in the, in the team time trial, but that was it, you know. So it was really, it was really tight all the right. time. But in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I have 15 seconds. Mm. I've lost a minute, 40, minute 50, whatever, in the first time trial. So I'm thinking, in my, and the final TT was long. I'm going, this, this isn't going to work, right? I don't feel great. And in, in he's probably thinking, I'll just stay here. I got, if I stay at 15 seconds, I will get this guy in the final TT. So I'm thinking, I have, which I had never thought of my career before that or after. I was like, I got to get some breathing room here. Or this guy is going to, he's going to jump me in the final time trial. And, uh, you know, I never would have thought that this stage unfolded like this with the crashes. And it's kind of two crashes when you think about Luz Ardenne, the kid, the, the incident with the kid. And then, you know, what really was an untold story was the bike was broke after that first crash. And so, Something and it broke right down by the chain stay and the bottom bracket. And what nobody realized it until the mechanics at the end of the day, you know, we would transport the bikes back on the on the on the bike rack. So he and you know, not like a, we have here in the states where the bike just goes on the back. So he put it up on top of the car. So the bottom rack was right in his face, and he's like, "That's correct." <laughs> and so the bike just didn't pedal the same. And you'll you'll see on the second little incident has to be a contributing factor there. So. so guys, I know I said it before on the, the, when we were talking about uh, the crowd, the fourth episode of our reliving the blue train, blue train memory was this day. This is one part of the reasons why this tour was so exciting. I mean, I remember in particular the morning of this stage, the already Den, like there was no margin for error. We mm -hmm. knew that uh, Jan's team had to drop all of us. We knew that we had to have one or two guys with you on the last climb. We knew that we had to make it as far as we possibly could with you, which I particularly had a decent day that day. But we knew that you had to get time on Jan Ulrich. Otherwise, the mm -hmm. chances of you winning the tour were very slim. Yep. So the tactics yep. were very simple on our side and on their side. And uh, the crash and, just made it all the and, more epic. And the reality is, if of the seven, um, if in six of them, my confidence was as close to a hundred percent as it possibly could be in this particular vintage, my confidence was as close to zero as it's, as it could have been. And so it, it just such a, you know, there's such a polar opposite that, uh, well, let's, let's get to it. You'll see. I mean, it, this was a day and I guess, you know, now that, yeah, I've, anyways, y'all were being very nice to me. I, I probably will watch this and be, happy that I dug you. This took everything I had. And, um, mm. and, and not to, not, not, you know, I don't want to Nick, uh, fail to mention that, you know, and you remember George after this, when I finally came down from the mountain after doing the protocol, the podium, I mean, I got in that bus. Mm. I was like, and it, it was like, we just won the Super Bowl. I mean, it was, the, it was like a locker room. The bus yeah. is a locker room. Remember that? It went fucking crazy. I, 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 well, like Kevin mentioned the other day, Jan would always wait for his teammates and thank him. We never saw you till the next morning, basically. Not sure we'd see you at dinner, but that day I remember quite quite well and quite fondly. Actually, you stopped the bus, pulled us over, jumped in the in the bus, started hugging everybody. It was it was a super special moment for all of us. Uh, that you had, you had gotten a lot of time back and you know fulfilled the plan that Johan said set out in the morning. Awesome. Well, let's get I, to it. Uh, wait, wait. Can I add this too? Because this was yeah. in, a, in an article I dug up. It was, uh, and I think George remembers this. Victor Hugo Pena said yep. he uh, he repeated a rant you did in the bus, a good rant. He said uh, 
said, uh, I've seen him happy before, but never like this. He stormed up and down the aisle, punching seats and shouting, no one trains like me. No one rides like me. This jersey is mine. I live for this jersey. It's my life. No one's taking it away from me while I'm around. This fucking jersey's mine. <laughs> well, <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> I'm not going to. That was that's too good. I'm not. I, I definitely said fucking at some point. I know that. I mean, okay. all right. Well, today's episode also brought to you by Waterloo Sparkling Water. Another brand I just absolutely love uh, out of Austin, Texas as well. It's bold. It's better for you. It is absolutely crushing. Parents getting their kids off soft drinks because the flavors are so damn good. Non-GMO, Whole30 approved, free of calories, sodium, sugar, artificial sweeteners for the benefit of their fans and the environment. It's also made in a BPA-free can. This happens. This is the black cherry, which I just love. This is the grapefruit. By the way, I had one of the competitors' grapefruits the other day. I was over in Crested Butte, pulled it out of the mini bar. I about spit it out. I couldn't believe it. I said, what, what just happened? I said, it has to be the same. It's grapefruit sparkling water. No, no, it is not the same. This stuff absolutely crushes. Um, got a bunch of new flavors out uh, this summer. They also have the, they do have the summer berry. They got blueberry. Uh, that's just out and lemon lime. So mom and dad, you're trying to get those kids off the sprites like I am. Try the lemon lime. It is a game changer. Head over to Whole Foods or Target or any of your local stores. Waterloo Sparkling Water out of Austin, Texas. Another company I'm a huge fan. I've been a fan for a long time. Actually, was such a fan that uh, me and my friends over at Next Ventures invested in the company. Don't know if that's a disclaimer or an endorsement. They are absolutely crushing it. When I think about the Aura Ring, and what it tells me every day is really three things, right? I get my readiness score when I wake up. So that's sort of how I slept. It also gives me my sleep score. And then I get an activity score. So, uh, you know, most people view it as a sleep tracker. It's also a kick-ass activity tracker. I'd never take it off. Uh, a lot of people might just sleep in it. I wear it all day long. Um, it, is, uh, it is the most accurate sleep tracking device on the market bar none. And uh, we love it. Uh, they also just did a big deal with the NBA. So as the NBA rolls out the new season here, or, or sort of the restarted season in the bubble, all the players, coaches, staff, personnel, everybody will be wearing the aura ring. It's just a, it's just a game changer fact. So head on over to aura ring.com. Check out your readiness score, your sleep score, and your activity score. Last one of the day, today's episode brought to you by Ventum. You can see it over there on the other side of my, over my left shoulder. This thing's a rocket ship. I'm telling, I've been biking on it, uh, road biking. They also got a new, uh, maybe it's top secret. They got a gravel bike on the way. Can't wait to check that out. They're the official global bike partner of Ironman. 30-day money-back guarantee. If you don't like the thing, I don't know, send it back. Lifetime warranty on all frames, financing options available in North America, trade-in programs available. Head over to VentumRacing.com slash the move and also sign up to, to, and register to win. See that thing? Look how sick that is. You got the WeDo logo. You got all the icons, custom paint. You can win the same bike. I got 20% off. If you go to VentumRacing.com slash the move, 20% off for our listeners. So, Johan, where – I'm just trying to remember the tournament. So, clearly, this is earlier on. Oh, look, here's George. George. George was there. George was spotted. <laughs> so, Lance, Lance, just for reference, right there is where you take that right turn with that one year you saw that sign where no gifts was on the, painted on that, that shack. You take a right mm -hmm. turn there, it gets super steep. That's basically where that is right there. Yeah. And so, here, here – Ulrich goes and he's, it looks like he's riding on the flat, hands okay. down in the handlebar. Wow. Yeah, well, this just, was, the, and this was a strange year. They started, correct me if I'm wrong, they started the year as Coast. The, yeah. the, the, the backer of the, the owner of Coast either just stopped paying. And so the team was in limbo. The team was basically going to go away. They picked up Bianchi, was, I, I don't know how they could have funded the team, but 
they were riding for not just for the tour, they were riding for their careers. And look at, I mean, yeah, not, exactly. at, at this point, I'm like, I'm, I'm screwed. I cannot follow this guy. So this the, is really interesting. By, by think, the way, George, so the, the, you sat in, the little you, stone, the little stone yeah. cabin there, it didn't say no <laughs> gifts. It said, I know what it said. It said anger is a gift. Anger is a gift. Sorry. Right. So it's when we went and previewed this stage and I, and you and I was just, you and I out there, we, we, I, and it was painted in red on the, on that little concrete, whatever shack on the side of the road. And I saw it and I thought, who the fuck put that there? That is, that is right. I raced on anger. And so I, I, it was, it was cosmic. Like when it appeared in front of me, I was like, oh, that I'm supposed to be right here right now. Mm. Where yeah, else, so, I'll, the, I'll tell you where else I'll tell you where else I was supposed to be is on his wheel, which yeah, I'm not. But, but you know what? I mean, it's I think you know you, you kind of look like you you kind of stay in control. Um, it was still very very far away from the finish, so Ulrich clearly doesn't know what he has to do. You know, I think he's you know he said okay, Lance is for sure going to be with me, so now he's always looking. You know, and we don't really know if he's going full gas or not. And you're staying there at 50 meters. But basically, I think that's the smart thing to do because he was, I mean, we're going to later see that on the, on the last climb, when he really has to have it all, what he's missing is maybe what he's wasted here, what he's, what he's spent here on this climb, you know? Because uh, that's, gonna on, be that's a, a great point. That's gonna a great be, point, but I don't think Lance is thinking that at that moment. <laughs> I okay, think Lance no. is going, he's going way too fast from here. And no, he was right my face. He was going too fast. My thinking is if I was with him, like on the wheel, which I suppose I could have done is that he would have thought, well, he's on my wheel. I'm going to go even faster, which would have been, I could not have hung. I, I couldn't have held that pace. So I thought, well, okay, give him a little space. He's going to feel as if he's got this right. He's going to maintain his, his quick tempo. And it, it, that would be a way for me to minimize my losses, but I didn't want to be on the wheel. And that guy lifted from there. Cause I would have been cooked, totally cooked. Yeah. But so here, look, here you're going to almost make it back, I guess. And he's going to accelerate again. You will see. Here you will see, look, he's going to accelerate. See, here he accelerates again. So basically, what you did was the right thing, because even if you couldn't follow him, these other guys, they were riding for second, for third, for fourth, for fifth, they were always going to catch you. They were always, you were always going to get him back. So... You know, he, uh, he definitely spent a little bit more than he should have there. And he was and, in a very unusual position for, uh, for you know, he, he hadn't been in that position for three, four years. And, and this is a long, yeah. you know, for the listener, viewer at home, the tourmalade on both sides, but especially this side is very, very long. And there's kind of, in your mind, you break it up into certain parts. You have the first part and then you get to the really what's a kind of a ski village. And then you have to get to the top. Like it is a long climb. N and never if I'm ended. wrong, Johan. We, there's no way we were expecting an attack from Jan Ulrich on the, turn, the early slopes of the Terminal A with such a long stage and such a hard climb to come at the end. We were not expecting that at all. No, completely, completely. It's a big surprise. Big surprise. I think I think Jan was actually surprised himself. In my opinion, his attack there was to basically get rid of a guy like Vino, you know, because Vino was in third. And, uh, you know, seeing that he was on his own, he, he basically, he didn't know what he had to do. But now once Lance is there, I think, uh, you know, he just goes slowly, sl I mean, uh, easily to the top. And then, and there's going to be two guys who are going to join, which is uh, Zubeldia and uh, Mayo. Hmm. So this, and this is, is Venukurov and Zubeldia and Basso, I guess, right? Basso, yep. It's interesting too to see you see you see this this period in time where helmets become mandatory. Like mm -hmm. well, a year or two years before mandatory, this, mandatory, but you, mandatory, but you can drop them at the bottom of the last climb. You could drop them. Is, so they had this sort of nice nightmare for you guys. Yeah, they phased this in, but you know they were mandatory. The you'll, the time trial helmet still could be a shell, but um, it's just cool to go back over the years. You go from no helmets to wearing helmets, but you could drop them on the final climb. And then you get to you know, the end of the run and you had to wear them the whole time. By the way, I'm a, I'm a, I don't know why I, th I, I I'm a supporter of helmets. I think on the final climb of the tour, 
or any big race. Oh, no, wait a no, minute. So, no. You know what? Why don't you push mute and let me talk? Um, <laughs> it, it, that, that we're going 10 miles an hour. They run 13 miles an hour in the New York City Marathon and they don't wear helmets. Take the helmets off, right? Pantani never would have been Pantani if his entire persona was covered up by a helmet and sunglasses. I'm not saying if you're riding 10 miles an hour uphill, ditch the helmet. I'm actually glad you're bringing this up. Can I Good. tell you why? Because in about a few minutes, we're going to see you hit the deck. And uh, you <laughs> thankfully did not hit your head, but it could have very gone, easily gone the other way. You slammed your head on the ground and you would not have gotten up. So I think helmets it's, on is a good thing. It's very, listen, don't, don't start with me. It's very, the odds are very, it's just rare that that happens. So here we're, this is already, this is the bottom of uh, the last climb now. So let's get back to the race, guys. So yeah. in the meantime, in the meantime, uh, teammates of uh, of Ulrich and teammates of us have joined again, and here we'll see again the same thing. You know, they will uh, Ulrich will put his uh, his rider on the front to uh, to make the tempo. So obviously he had something in mind. You know, uh, you may also say, okay, well, you know, Ulrich prefers to ride his own tempo in a you know a steady tempo, and that's why he puts him on the front. But I think this day. Ulrich had special plans. Well, he there was blood in the water. I mean, let's be honest. He 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 knew, um, and and so, and and when this happens, you know, you know, it's like any sporting event. You have confidence. Them, you know, as they say, uh, uh, Mister Momentum has changed mm -hmm. his address, right? And so he had the momentum. He had the confidence. He had the vibe. And we were on our. I've said it multiple times. We were on our heels. This is a mental battle going on right here between you and Jan because you see Chechu coming up going straight to the front and then you see Jan's teammate no, it's, doing the it's same tricky. thing where it's, it's, it's a it's question tricky. of who's in front it's tricky well, who's it's tricky, but then uh, Chechu George. later on comes yeah. on so yeah, yeah, yeah. The, both teams are trying to prove who's stronger at this moment and trying to get a little bit of a mental edge at the you know the early slopes of this climb yeah so this is uh, what's his name again Garmendia Aitor Garmendia mm. Was a strong rider. Mm -hmm. Very strong. Another Basque rider. I, yeah. I couldn't have, I couldn't have guessed that name if my life depended on it. But <laughs> um, that's why you have me on. That's right. Yeah, you you do know everything. You always did know everything. It was Jean Marie Leblanc. Well. Was Sastre went on to win the tour a couple of years later. Somehow, I mean, how did he win the tour, George? Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this in it, in, in just to kind of, to put myself back in that place, I'm going, God, would these guys please slow down? I was, I was totally on the limit and I'm like, this is not good. I, I, I <laughs> if I need more cushion, there's no way I don't, and you'll see what unfolds. I don't know how, how it happened. I mean, maybe they're, you know, they're they were remembering your bluff from a few years prior. Yeah. Well, this, that would, yeah, that's when it goes to hurt you. Right. I mean, this was not a bluff. This was, uh, so at this point you're not feeling great because you put chat you on the front here in a minute. So that's why I was wondering where you actually started maybe perhaps feeling a bit better. Um, I well, think because comes around this guy here in a little bit before you crash again, it's, it's all optics, right? You can put your guy on the front when he's on the front, you look as if you're strong, you look as if you're in control and you can control the pace. Right. So if I say, Hey, you're, uh, Chechu, you know, back it off just a little, which I've never said in my entire career. Um, but it, yeah, it was just a way to kind of um, control the script a little bit. I would like to come back on that, Lance. You said that once in your career. On, uh, on Morzine? No, on Tourmalet, but another year when Heras was pulling with you and Basel. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember that. I don't remember <laughs> I a lot. Here comes yeah, Chechu. So. Watching this earlier, uh, this is where I'm thinking you're starting to feel better, where you're putting Chechu to the front, or again, it might well, have this, been a mental play, or you want your guy this in is, front. This is still tricky, eh, by the way. Chechu is sitting there in like seventh, eighth position behind uh, Mayo. Oh, look at this. Not, uh, this look, look at the hair. Look at the hair of Franco Pelizzotti. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> to my to to my point, it, you would not have. That is a good look. I mean, I I can't rock. I can't pull that look off. But that's a good look. 
you wouldn't <laughs> know he had that look if he if he was wearing a helmet, right? And so, you know, the, the, I'm a I'm a fan. Let let personalities have have him be personalities. And look at Jan here. He looks totally easy. And yeah, I'm watching this yeah. going, I am so fucked. <laughs> but let's I'm not serious. forget, let's not forget what he spent on the Tourmalet from the attack, which is which was very far down till the very top. It's been only one guy pulling. It was Ulrich. Whether you were 50 meters behind or with him or together. Look here, you you do a counterattack from uh Mayo. It's, this is before, yeah. This is before the crash. This so. is here come the crash is coming because yeah. this is in Mayo was a is, is just a more here comes. Watch yeah. this. But you can already see Ulrich has already, you know, he's not a, he's not responding very fast. So you could see, Watch you know, this. you obviously here comes. Yeah. yeah. Here comes. Uh, oh. Don't ride close to the fans, kids. <laughs> <laughs> that, and by the way, I hit the ground. Normally, you can get something out, get a hand out, get a leg out, clip out, anything. Watch this. Boom. I hit. It was like Mike Tyson hit me in the face. I hit the ground that fast. I, I had yeah. no idea what hit me. And then starts. No need to have, no need to have a helmet on for that. I agree. I completely agree. But, and then starts this whole, and this last lasted, it's still probably lasting to this day is, you know, this question of etiquette in the Peloton and, and the etiquette amongst your peers and the favorites and the champs, do you wait something like this? And, and, um, and look at Jan, Jan, um, always a class guy, always a class guy, clearly looking, waiting, checking bunch of debate after this on, on, on did he wait? Did I don't he know if he's wait. waiting for you there, brother. He's at that moment. I'm not sure he's quite waiting. Oh, look, look at this. Look, yeah, this is, I can't get in the pedal. Something's wrong with that bottom bracket either. And the cleat was not broken by the way. Cause I, I, I didn't change shoes or cleats until the end of the tour, but some, what? I mean, I got one nut left. Watch this, watch this. <laughs> Ooh, there goes the good one. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about that yesterday. I, I was mean, thinking I about that yesterday when I watched when I watched that footage. I fucking survived life threatening all this. Lose one, down, down half. But I do, damn, but I do. Damn near lost the last one. I do remember one thing though. Is if, if if you just a few seconds ago, I was just next to you there with the car, and I was trying to say something to you. It was so much noise, and I had the window open, and you just looked into the window, and. By the way, you looked. I knew that something big was going to happen. You, you were, you were on fire. There was so much adrenaline. I mean, so much determination hey, look, that he, he looks pissed by the end of this. By the it's, way, we need to, we need to all to talk about how I mean, Chachu had clearly sat up for the day, and you just happened to crash the moment Chachu sat up, ready to roll in easy. Uh, that you were really lucky that he would happen to be at the back of the peloton and be able to bring you back up to the front. He just adrenaline, adrenaline took over in there, and he got you back up there where you needed to be. Yeah, I just think about that kid with the bag. He's like thirty now, and his he's gets to tell that story in bars. I'm the guy that took down Armstrong. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Look at look, look at Buy Chechu, man. What a look at Chechu. What a class. You know, I mean. He's, he's just there whenever he needs to be there. You know, he's, uh, you know, he was out already, brings you back first, then gets dropped and now starts to pull us. It's incredible. This guy. Yeah, he was, he was, as you said yesterday, if we could have, uh, eight Chechus, we'd be okay. Right. Johan? No, no, no. F four Georges and four Chechus. I said, so what are you going to say? What are you going to say when we have Eki on? Oh shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you better start cutting it up. Uh, well, now is it two and a half Georges, two and a half Chechus, <laughs> two and a half Ekis? Okay. For these for these stages, it's eight Chechus for these stages. That's fair. That's fair. Luzer de Dan also also not short, also mm -hmm. not easy. This is this is a tough climb. This is and, and one of the more iconic. If you go back in the history of the tour, this this is a um, this is hollow ground. Here goes Mayo again, and just personally, I just I don't know, man. And this going back to the Dolphin A, why I pushed exactly. on. Yeah, I, I I I'll just be honest. I didn't like this guy. Like I told you about Beloki the other day. Just such a class. I I couldn't. I just didn't like Mayo. I'm like this fucker. What is this guy thinking? And it. I guess obviously right now it's helping me, but I persisted in the Dolphin A because of him which was a mistake. And I'm, and I'm countering here because of him, which ended up being a good thing, but 
he was, I'll give it to him. That, that little guy was explosive. Like in his yeah. day when he wanted to go on a climb, shit, you better hold on. I mean, we we're hitting the brakes. It's in switchbacks at times. But here you see Jan is not the same Jan anymore from, from the Tourmalet. Different guy, you know? Mm-hmm. It looks different. Then you look at the pedal stroke. So now you're going to see he's going to go a little bit more down and down with the shoulders. That's when I saw started. He went down with the shoulders and looked at the bottom bracket. That's when I knew he was done. You know what else we knew uh, mm. about this stage? We knew who Georgine Cappy was going to marry. <laughs> mm. <laughs> this was the year. Oh, we knew that, but this was the year. That is. This was the year you slipped her that note. You so slipped her that note. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you slipped this pretty girl a note. She didn't speak a lick of English. You didn't speak a lick of French. You slipped her this note. She got let go because she engaged with a rider. But I, I'll never forget once this is over and I'm up on the on the podium with your soon to be wife, and I see you come across the line That's and there's right. photos out there and it was I mean obviously I didn't know that that, that would lead to a marriage and three beautiful yeah. kids and all this it's all the perfect stuff all the unicorn shit you got going on <laughs> um I have that photo actually in my basement where you're pointing at me as I'm coming across the line yeah what do we there's and, another there's there's another funny story Lance which uh, about, about this stage uh which I think you actually uh, got quite some motivation out. You're, you, you're about to catch uh, Sylvain Chavanel here, who has been out the whole day. Mm-hmm. Um, but so uh, there was somebody working on our team who was a little bit close with Pavenage, with Rudy Pavenage, the director of Young. And the year before, Pavenage had asked a favor if he could get one of your yellow jerseys to this guy, to Lorenzo. And for some reason, you know, it never happened. And uh, before that day, he said to, or two days before that day, he said to Lorenzo, hey, listen, you don't have to ask that yellow jersey anymore. We're going to have our own. Yeah. We're going to take it away from him. <laughs> and you heard that story. And uh, I guess that was a little bit of extra oil on the fire for, for that day. Yeah, well, you know, as as Dave Chappelle says when he, remembers about the first time he met Kanye West checkmate motherfucker <laughs> by the way if y'all are ever bored I watch this clip like once a week <laughs> Google Dave Chappelle meets Kanye and is on I think it was on Conan and one of his shows it is the it is five it's the some of the best five minutes of YouTube you can ever imagine him recounting the first Kanye was nobody Kanye was nobody. Kanye was convinced he was the next Elvis. Checkmate. Huh. <laughs> George is like, well, I'm going to go watch that after he, this. He might be our next president. <laughs> you know, we get in trouble talking about politics on this show. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay away from that. <laughs> that, that. We're not talking about politics. I'm just talking facts. Well, I, I know, but so I was about how many, I was, how many days I was, after this? I, I was about to start po- talking about politics. Oh, so that's why I stopped. Right. Was the time trial the next day after this? Because clearly you're putting in a major effort to get more time on Jan, which you needed because you only had 15 seconds on him and he had put a minute and 40 on you in the time trial before that. So I'm just uh-huh. curious. I think we had I think we had a transition stage the next it was day. Not, it, was not, it was not the, the next day because this, this, this is the Pyrenees and, the, and the, the time trial was in Nantes. So no, it's impossible. Yeah. By the way, how do you, a couple of transitions how do you, after this though? How do you remember all this, Johan? Like I, I don't even know where Nantes is. Like if my life depended on it and you said, okay, point to the map of France, I it's a it's this fucking encyclopedia, it, your brain. It's amazing. Yeah. What's 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 amazing also is the fact, you know, if you if you think back on and then we've later found out that this frame was broken. It was it was not cracked, it was broken. Hmm. And you know, the way you go up uh you know obviously you saw that when you had to put a lot of power on the pedals that it skipped the 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 gear skip that's what happened at the bottom but uh you know you're doing the last 10 kilometer of this climb also out of the pedals and uh so obviously that was uh that was not that was not an advantage no no that that doesn't help not recommended i was also just struck 
you know, and we always talked about this a lot in the meetings and as we would go into the Pyrenees, especially the Pyrenees that started to get close to the Basque country. I mean, that team essentially uh, as a government, as a country, they refer to themselves as a country. They had their own team, right? And they were great mm-hmm. between Mayo, Zubeldia, all these guys. Um, and you just, if you went back a minute, so many fans, you see more there, the Basque flag, and they were, uh, that was the rowdiest bunch. And they were always, I have to say, always uh, on the respectful side. They were rowdy, but they were, they were very respectful. But man, we talked about it like, hey, this is, we're getting close to the Basque country. And, and just think about that, right? And so obviously, I mean, here you now have the barriers, but. Those guys would rally. Oh man. And, and they'd stay for days. the bottom of the climb, they had three or four guys in that group. So they, yeah. would, they would base their whole tour to France on those stages. And here yeah, and just, I guess, and I here. think that the, the year before, I think Lyseka won there, won, won uh, on, on Luzardi then, one of the, one of their riders. Mm-hmm. And I'm just thinking, just, God, just get me as much, get me as far away from this guy, Jan, as possible. Like I am going to go as hard as I can for as long as I can to get to the, I just have to get away from this. This guy's coming, right? I'm, and I'm going to start the final time trial and be getting time checks and knowing, and it was, and we can even, once this is done, go on, we should touch on what that was like, because obviously we know what happened uh, with his crash, but I think I lost six, six seconds in the first kilometer. The first two kilometers. Yeah. That was, that was not good to hear. You're six seconds down in 2k. So in my mind, I'm going, shit, I got times three. Oh boy. I mean, it's, it's a good indication of how hard you went by coming across the line and just no reaction, uh, just complete exhaustion. Yeah, it's everything you got till the finish. Mm-hmm. But that was, you know, there were so many things this year in 2003, whether it's the luck of having that entryway into the field, Jan's bad luck in the final TT, it was pouring rain. Uh, time trials are never that fun, but when the, when you're on the start ramp and it's dumping, uh, we actually knew that that roundabout that he ended up crashing in was very slick. I mean, I went through it at maybe two miles an hour. He had the bad luck of falling. And of course, uh, you know, we heard immediately, which Johan told me immediately. But this was a year, we we dodged so many bullets in 2000. Yes, but you know what? I mean, not, not, to, give, not to give herself credits, but... Uh, you know, we were better prepared than them. That was one of the advantages we had to make up for the lack of form because, uh, you know, we went very early in the season to preview the, the, the time trial. Uh, when we went to Circuit de la Sarthe, I think we, we went there before. So you knew the time trial already in the month of April. And then in the morning of the time trial, of that crucial time trial in 2003, we went to preview it again in the rain. Mm-hmm. And later on, we found out that Jan did not preview it during the season and not even in the morning. He stayed in bed and watched a video of the, of the, the time trial. And ultimately, yeah. you know, you could easily contribute the crash to lack of knowledge of the course. So, so where does the blame, and I'm not, not that maybe blame is too strong of a word, Johan, but where does, whose fault was that? Like if I, if I said to you, Hey, Johan, I, you know, I'm just, I'm going to just hang in bed and, and watch a video, right? You would have said, no, you're not. Get your ass out of bed. No, I, I, think, I think it's the fault of the director. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I agree. If you, if you, and especially in his situation, I mean, this is his playground, time trial. Mm-hmm. He has proven already that he could beat you before. And now in the most important stage of the whole three weeks, you're, not, you're going to go out not knowing the course. I mean, that doesn't make sense. Mm-mm. You know, I mean, even, even, I would say, even if it would have been really super bad weather and cold, I would have forced you to come with me and we would have driven it by car so that at least you see the course. You know, he, Jan had no idea. He was just getting on his bike at the start ramp and just following instructions from the director who had seen a video of it. So, you know. Johan, not, on, not only that, not only did, he, did Lance see the course in April, do it in the morning but you made it very clear to all of us, most of us, that we needed to go hard and we needed to give you every bit of information of what every corner was like at full speed uh, before Lance went. So, I mean, he had yeah. all the information he could get. I remember I had, I don't remember who it was. I, I think it was probably Pena. 
uh, or, or, or yeah, 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 no, no, but I mean, I had, <laughs> I know, but I had information from some of you that that particular corner was really dangerous. Mm -hmm. And obviously young had no idea. Yeah. Around, around about that. If it, if it were to be dry would be perfectly fine. I mean, mm -hmm. there's always ifs and buts and, and preparation and luck and all those things you've always talked about. But had Jan not gotten, gone down in that time trial, would he have won the tour? I can't. So yeah. it's, it's a good question, JB. So let's just roughly say I started with a minute. Uh, he, he, he gets six seconds on me almost immediately. Um, I, I did normalize. Where, where were we? And, you, you know, again, I'm going to defer to the encyclopedia on this. Joan, where were we when he crashed? It was almost even, you know, like you, you lost, he went, he, he started very fast and then you kind of caught up and it was, it was always five seconds up, five seconds down. It was, I, without the crash, uh, young would still have not won the tour. Mm -hmm. the and, and I, and I think this goes to, to the mentality and the advice of the director. Cause I can, I know, uh, I, I knew how they, we knew how they operated. I can hear now, I can hear Pev and I was telling Jan, listen, come out guns a blazing, get immediately get 15 seconds on him. Cause you're, you're his three minute man. So he's going to hear immediately. Johan's going to tell him immediately that you're 15 seconds down. Um, that's, you know, again, memo to kids. That's not good. It is a long time trial at the end of the tour. The best advice is to ride your race. So, um, but I can see Rudy is, he was very, uh, emotional like that. And that's, that's not good advice. I don't think. No, I'm pretty sure that's the advice he got, but, uh, no, I'm, I'm still, I'm still convinced that without the crash, he wouldn't have taken back one minute 15. You had one minute 15 seconds on him. So. Well, that and clearly there was a momentum change. I mean, after Lance's Lou's already done the performance, his confidence was slowly creeping back up. Um, so it wasn't like it was going to be a, a given that he was going to take a minute 40 at a glance. The momentum had shifted. It was three weeks into the tour. I mean, a time trial after three weeks of the Tour de France is completely different than a time trial after a couple of days. It's a different Absolutely. animal. Uh, oh, and I, let's hope that sometime soon before this seven parter is over, your, your internet gets some momentum too, George. I just... <laughs> <laughs> you got my point, I hope. JB, back me up, JB. It's pretty bad. <laughs> There's got to be All right. a way. All right. I'm, I'm going to go have lunch. I'm, have, I'm actually going to step in the other room, have lunch with Mark Sisson. If you guys know uh, anything about the human performance and optimization, he's one of the real thought leaders. Awesome guy. I've known 30 years back from my try days, but a little shout out to Mark Sisson. But um, this is, yeah, looking back at these years, that one particular year, boy, it was a, uh, you know, your parents would have told you that it's a character builder, builds character. And I, and I would have said, fuck that. I don't want or need any more character. But these were, the, it, all the other years were fun. All the other years were, didn't seem, this was work. I was like, man, I am working. I don't want to be working. So, mm, glad it's over. I got, I, got, I got like four millimoles of lactate just watching this year. <laughs> It was so good. We had to split it up into two different shows. I know. I know. Boys, thanks for, uh, thanks for being here. And to our, uh, our members, thanks for tuning in. Um, hopefully don't, we don't seem too clumsy. Uh, we, we much appreciate it. And uh, to anybody viewing on any of the other platform, listening or viewing, we really appreciate it. What do we got? Two more? Two more to go? Two more. Yeah, two more to go. Yeah, two more. And then hopefully the tour will happen. Yeah. Well, we heard it from the encyclopedia. It was, he's calling 80% right now. So I, I do. Th and look, I'm, man, I'm fingers crossed. I don't want to, I want to watch the tour and not for nothing. I think it's going to be a weird tour. I think the, the lack of racing, the, the, the uncertainty around all of it, I, I think it's just going to add, you know, fireworks, which I think for fans and for people sitting at home watching, that's what you want. So fingers crossed. Yeah. All right, y'all. Thanks. Thank you. Talk to you in a couple of days. Thank you. Bye. Bye.